BYU at Baylor coming up Saturday. Lots to discuss in this one. This morning, I chatted with BYU radio analyst Riley Nelson about the matchup. Riley, a roller coaster of emotions from Saturday to now where, hey, the undefeated season's over. BYU coughs it up a bunch. Uh, now BYU's playing a tough Baylor team. Maybe the toughest game left on the schedule. What are you going through emotionally as you navigate a season that obviously has been successful for BYU, 5-1 and one through the first six, but now BYU plays a tough Baylor team, and, and you hope that BYU comes out with a win, which would actually be an upset according to Vegas, even though BYU's the ranked team. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you're trying not to dwell on the past, but it was it was a disappointment. You take away the points off turnovers, and the defense performed great, right? Holding their offense only to field goals, and the offense. Obviously, there was enough pr- enough production from a yardage standpoint, but the unfortunate fumble in the red zone. Anyway, it's it's been well documented. My, my tough thing is two losses in a row. It, like if you were to lose game three and game eight and finish the regular season ten and two you don't lose as much momentum because you, you know, you take a minor hit and you and staring down the barrel is what is there to me, the toughest challenge, uh, at least definitely thus far. And probably what will be of their entire 12 game season. Uh, it will definitely be an up, get uphill climb. And if they don't happen to come out on top, you've got the two losses right in the middle of the season. That's going to take all the steam out of at least the publicity and the notoriety. I know the locker room. I know Sataki. I know the coaches, the captains, they don't care as much about this as we all do, but suffering two losses right in the middle of the schedule puts you in this V scenario, right? Well, sorry, actually it was up, then down, and then climbing your way back up. Um, but Washington State, USC, Virginia, you know, these games on the back end of the schedule have potential to, you know, quicken that slope back up into, you know, being a top 20, top 15, maybe even if they can, if they can somehow pull it out of Baylor, then they'd be right back in the top 10 conversation. But you asked how I was feeling and I just let a whole bunch of thoughts and emotions out on you. So needless to say, I'm uh, conflicted, but hopeful. Yeah. It's, and it's interesting too, because Saturday it's like, Hey, if BYU takes care of the ball, probably wins that game. Um, let's talk to quarterback situation versus turnovers. What will have a bigger impact on the game? BYU's ability to take the ball away and not cough it up or Quarterback play. Great question. I I don't mean to be too simplistic, but I think it's turnovers. Uh, Kalani Kalani Sitake coach teams whenever they take care of the football, they win the va- They win every game. I think it's every game but a couple. And you know the five seasons, well, going on five seasons that he's been here, uh, and this team has shown that they're a complete team that's able to. Uh, get it done in all three phases. So I think, uh, and quarterback play is only one aspect of the offense. Uh, I believe, and Jim helped me out here, but I believe it was Coach Lamb who said this week, you know, you can't, when you ride a guy like Tyler Algier or Lopini Katoa to, you know, victories early in the season, a couple of times that they happen to lose the ball and you lose, you can't turn around and turn your back on them. So those guys, the run game has been able to win games of itself with defense and special teams. So that long answer, but the short, short answer is it's turnovers over quarterback play, because I think the rest of the, the phases would be able to overcome a potential lackluster quarterback play, which by the way, there hasn't been. I mean, there's been some games where the quarterbacks perform better than others, but the but the floor for through six games is still pretty high for all of the quarterback. I guess both both Baylor and and uh, Jaron. Yeah, and it's super interesting that way because Jaron Hall did not run last week. He's got a rib injury. It makes sense why he didn't run. Aaron Rod- Roderick said this week, "No, he's ready to go. Like he can run now. We're, he's good, which is great news." Baylor Romney's coming back from a concussion. Hopefully he's available Saturday, but the likelihood is that he's probably not. Aaron Roderick mentioned yesterday that uh, Jacob Conover is actually getting more reps with the number twos than Baylor Romney is right now. So who knows? Well, Thursday's a big day from practice of who establishes what and when and going into the game. But let's say turnover margins even. So it's straight up, right, with Baylor. How does BYU win this game against a Baylor team that Vegas is telling us is better than BYU? Yeah, and I think just uh, that that Vegas line, I think, has to do a lot a lot of the fact that it's a sellout. I believe it's homecoming for Baylor, and uh, they're coming off a big performance last week. Keep in mind, Vegas is not purely objective. They also play on the emotions of betters, and so you've got 
Baylor coming off their best offensive performance last season and then BYU coming off probably their worst. So uh, a lot of the, I think in a vacuum, it's probably not six and a half points. It's probably a little bit tighter than that, but I can also see why Vegas put out that line because your average voter or sorry, your average better out there, um, you know, probably is, is parlaying the emotions from the last week performances. Uh, but if all things are equal if in the turnover margin, all things are equal. Jaron Hall, look, he, he needs to avoid contact. There's no question about that. I think all, all BYU fans, if we could have the Max Hall days back where you knew that you were going to trot the same quarterback out there for three straight seasons, we'd all take those in a heartbeat. And one of the ways that you do that as a quarterback is you avoid contact, but there's a difference between avoiding contact and being scared of contact when you're injured, even if you're not, consciously, um, you know, scared, so to speak, or consciously hesitant or reluctant, um, subconsciously that could potentially be there. And I think I, I think I saw that a little bit now that last play of the game, you know, he exposed his ribs, took a shot to the ribs, popped right back up. But I mean, which, which was great that every quarterback has got to be able to stare down the, you know, stare down the barrel of getting popped while he's throwing the ball, but this offense, all things being equal, this offense is best when Jaron Hall is running. And I'm not talking about 13, 15 carries a game. I'm talking about what we've seen from it, what we saw from him against Utah, what we saw from him against Arizona State, which were performances about seven to nine carries and producing somewhere between, you know, 60 to 70 yards. It keeps the defense honest. It allows you to pick up timely conversions in key spots in the game, whether it's third downs, whether it's, you know, flipping, he had a couple of big runs in both those previously mentioned games of 20, 30 yards that flipped field position led to the scoring drives. Um, so if he isn't ready to use his legs the, in, in their full capacity, then that's going to be a difficult obstacle for this BYU offense to overcome. We're talking to Riley Nelson, radio analyst with BYU Radio. You can hear him every game day calling the games on BYU Radio. Riley, when you look at BYU and Baylor and this situation with Jeff Grimes and Eric Mateos on that side, you were a guy that switched teams. So th it seems like it'd be obvious that Jeff Grimes and Eric Mateos are saying, this is how we did things, to try and get an advantage of the gamesmanship there. So my question is this. When you transferred to BYU, did you talk about what Utah State did because you're trying to win that game. Yeah, this is an unspoken rule uh, specific to my situation. When I transferred, it was uh, also a new coaching staff. So there weren't as many of those proprietary, but from a personnel standpoint, I was like, yeah, I mean, here's what I think about this guy. Here's, you know, practicing against this guy. Here's, I think where we can attack him. Here's where he's strong. Here's where he's weak. So I think that's going on, but it, look, it, it happens and everybody understands that it happens. Um, but in fact, I, funny anecdote, I was listening to, uh, Spence check on ESPN 700 up here, who obviously that's a huge station was interviewing Arizona state cause they play Arizona state and the Arizona state play by play guy was talking about how, and by the way, I'm cause I'm on BYU sports nation. So I'm going to call this out for what it was <laughs> just throwing all sorts. It was just excuses. Cause they were talking about BYU's, uh, the BYU Arizona state game and the play by play announcer was talking about how BYU has a grad assistant that was with the pro was with Arizona state last year and how they spent all this time changing signals and changing the way they communicate so that signs wouldn't be stolen uh, to me, honestly, for a seasoned staff like Herm Edwards and, and the rest of those guys, if they're making those kind of mistakes, then that's on them. They've been through this before. What happens when you have, whether it's coaches or players switch is at the beginning of the week, you know, Dave Aranda and the defensive side of the ball is going to come over to Jeff Grimes after having done their initial film study and said, Hey, they run this concept. What do you think? Hey, this guy, I think might give us some trouble. Can you give us some pointers? But the reality is if you deviate too much, worrying about this kind of insider trading or this backroom espionage, you're going to, you're going to put yourself out of your, what you normally do, what you're best at, right? So the best recipe for any team when going against uh, a, an opponent where you know, someone from your side has recently switched over to their side is continue business as usual, realize that even if they know what's coming, they still have to stop it. And if you execute at a high level, that's going to be very difficult for them. So don't get outside of your, you know, don't get outside of your head. Don't get, or I better said, don't get in your head too much. Go in there doing what you got to do, knowing that, yeah, they might, if you've got a couple, you know, 
wrinkles up your sleeve. They might be prepared to get those where you might catch a different opponent unprepared, but you run your base stuff and you focus on execution, execution, execution. And if you, like we said, or it's like the old, remember the Titans line, right? We got six plays. It's like Novocaine, you know, you give it time. It, it'll always work, which that whole philosophy is based on execution. And I think this BYU offense is based on execution. So even though Grimes and Mateos may be feeding Miranda one or two points here, I don't think it gives them any kind of significant advantage. And it goes both ways, right? BYU knows how Grimes and Mateos function and coach and probably how those signals come in. So that's super interesting. And so what we just learned, Riley, is that if you really want to succeed, according to the Arizona State play-by-play, -play, all you do is hire a GA or staffer of some kind from every team you're going to play <laughs> on the next season, right? Yeah, exactly. And not to diminish <laughs> the role of GAs, but, like, the guys who are, like, they're – just the life of a GA, right? You're making cutups. You're you don't have much say in the strategy or the game plan that's actually implemented. You have a big role in the execution of it all, but like in that staff room, you're putting together cutups. You're pulling, you know, you're doing the statistics on the film. When it comes to the actual strategy and the play calling on the field, you have next to zero influence. Baylor's running for seven yards a carry and haven't thrown an interception, and they've been really impressive. They have some nice wins. First three games are pretty easy. Last three, um, you know, some nice wins there. Um, what do you see as advantages that BYU perhaps has over Baylor that it can exploit? I think um, the advantages are just – a deeper schedule of having been tested starting off the program or starting off the year, the schedule with three P fives, um, you know, going on the road against Utah state, taking their lumps against Boise state, right. There couldn't have been kind of a more deflating or, or, or kind of leave a bad taste in your mouth kind of lost than, than was Boise state last week. Whereas yeah, Baylor suffered a tough defeat, but it was more like a moral victory defeat. They haven't hit, Baylor, I guess this is a long way of saying BYU has the advantage of really being tested, having their metal tested. Now they're going to have to prove they're going to have to come out this week and show how well they passed that test or not by how well they're prepared and how much they and how effectively they've been able to put Boise State behind them. But that to me is the main advantage schematically or talent wise. This these teams are pretty evenly matched, so I don't see whether it's a front seven matchup or their receivers versus our DBs or our receivers versus their DBs. Uh, I don't see any kind of significant weakness that either team could exploit at which makes me most excited for this game. I think this thing is going to be, I, I don't know that it'll, I think it'll be like a shootout, but not like a shootout in the forties. I think a shootout in the high twenties, low thirties, but it's going to be one of those games like, a Tennessee was two years ago or a USC was two years ago where like, it's going to come down to the end of the game and who's going to step up and make a big play. And like those two games I mentioned from the 2019 season, hopefully it's someone from BYU and they can come out. What will be a really quality, quality, like landmark win on this season schedule. It is a Big 12 showcase game, whether we like it or not, right? BYU's going to the Big 12 in two years, and all of a sudden, boom, BYU plays Baylor, and now everyone in Big 12 country is going to be watching this. I want to go back to Jaron Hall for a second. Do you feel like his rush aggression level could be or might be dictated according to Baylor Romney's availability? Ooh. Uh, good question. It might be. Uh, it's I don't know because I'm not in the, in the room. So I'll, I'm just going to speak from my experience. It cannot. It cannot be contingent upon who his backup is. It's the old, whether you want to call it, you know, the old Viking method of burning the ships or the old cliche that if you have a plan B, you don't really have a plan A. Baylor needs to go in there with a winning mindset, whatever he and Coach Roderick determined that to be, and even Coach Satake did determine that to be and can go out and execute. And I think, like I said earlier, this BYU offense is best when he's running. I think he's best when he's running. And uh, no matter who the backup is, honestly, at, at that point, that goes back to what I said, like you can play to avoid contact, but if you're playing scared, reluctant, or hesitant in any way, it, it does two things. One, it limits your opportunity to actually be productive. But two, in my experience, it, it actually increases the likelihood that you get injured again because you're not playing at that full speed you're not playing all out so i i sure as heck, i sure hope that um his willingness or aggressiveness in the run game is not contingent upon whoever's backing him up 
We'll see what happens Saturday, 1.30 Eastern time. BYU Radio coverage begins. Riley, as always, we appreciate the time, man. Thank you so much.